Welcome to Naked Reflections, brought to you from the Wolf Institute. I'm Ed Kessler, and each week I'll be taking an in-depth look at the stories reported by our friends over at the Naked Scientists. What does the latest scientific stuff mean for the rest of us? Stay with us and find out. Hello and welcome to Naked Reflections. The word diaspora comes to us as a metaphor from agriculture. The original Greek means to scatter around. And when Greek merchants of late antiquity moved around the Mediterranean and then the Black Sea, they were unknowingly, perhaps, scattering Greek culture as they went. An active Greek diaspora for sure, but probably not an oppressive one. But diasporas can and have been the result of oppression. The term can imply something like a group solidarity held in exile. Here's Dunya Habash talking about the diaspora of Syrian musicians and refugees on the Naked Reflection show, The Movement of Peoples. So I'm working with mainly like Syrian refugees and artists in exile at the moment. The main driving force for the three million plus Syrians who have moved to Turkey since the civil war started is mainly economic factors. Even for artists and musicians, you know, in war, the first thing that goes is the leisure activities. So many musicians and artists left and thought that Turkey would be a nice alternative. The diaspora is our subject this week. Is it just a posh word for migration? Both words mean there are strong ties to a homeland. People perhaps leaving because of lack of opportunity or forced to flee because of war. In the age after empire, many subject communities seem to be drawn irresistibly by the magnet of the former colonial power, where they form their own, sometimes unwelcome, diaspora communities. Diaspora communities can be huge. According to the UN, the most numerous is the Indian diaspora, estimated at 17 and a half million. My guests today are well suited themselves to discussing this subject. They are Dr. Esther Miriam Wagner, Executive Director of the Wolf Institute, who hails from the now defunct state of East Germany. And Father Dragos Horescu, a Romanian who is Principal of the Institute for Orthodox Christian Studies here in Cambridge. Well, welcome both. Miriam. Do you think of a diaspora as a group of scattered individuals with a shared geographical or ethnic identity, or as a group of like-minded people displaced from their origins, as Dunya implies? For me, there's definitely a community element. I don't think it's coincident that we most often talk about diaspora with groups that have been displaced by war or that have suffered some sort of trauma. I mean, the Armenian diaspora, we talk about the Jewish diaspora. Of course, with Jews, it's a very particular circumstance because the diaspora is even baked into ritual. It's baked into the liturgy. So that's a very, very particular group. And I think what's so interesting about diaspora communities is that they very often take a life of their own. They are cut off from their origins and then they very often sort of hail back to a time in the past, which makes them often more conservative than their surroundings or their original communities. And I think that's something that when people think of diaspora, that's what they think about. A good example is um, the Turkish diaspora in Germany. I'm a linguist. I'm very interested in how people speak. And uh, whenever I talk to Turkish Turkish people about Turkish Germans, they laugh about the conservative element of their language. They think, oh, they all talk like my grandparents or my great-grandparents. And for them, it's hilarious to hear 17-year-olds talk like in the olden days. So there's always this conservative element. Is happening. there a conservative element? Because I know, Dragos, in the Orthodox communities, you could argue, for example, that some of the Orthodox communities in the West are more liberal, perhaps, than the Orthodox in, in the homeland. That's certainly true of the Russian Orthodox Church and the Moscow Patriarch. I don't know whether that's true in your Orthodox community. Well, there's certainly a tension between the heritage and the practice that you can have in your original country, where the whole context, the social context, the cultural context is, in some instances, very different from the one that you experience um, as a migrant or as a person living in a diaspora community. So there is certainly more flexibility, more fluidity, and possibly a, a need to adapt and to respond to the changing realities and the variables that you encounter in a diaspora community, also in terms of the practice of faith, uh, for example. I wonder, Dragos, whether we can apply some of that to the Romanian Orthodox 
Christian community, um, because it is very widespread, isn't it? Is there that sort of sense that, you know, Romanian Orthodox Christian from Cambridge like yourself and a Romanian Orthodox Christian, say, in the United States will be on the same page or will they be remarkably different because of the culture and the land in which they live? That's a very good question. I think to a degree there is a certain overlap in the experience, in the identity, but certainly the new environment or the contextual conditions that one has in a particular country will influence how things develop, um, how they make that identity their own. I think one of the difficulties that the communities have is when they try to tooth and nail, as it were, stick to a rigid identity or an idea about what it means to be Romanian Orthodox or Greek Orthodox or Russian Orthodox or whatever you want to call it. So so then that's when you start developing tensions. That's when you start developing a kind of an enclave mentality or a, or a ghetto mentality, um, whether that's cultural or religious. It depends, uh, or sometimes it's both. But yes, I, I think people would recognize uh, their common heritage if they were to meet, let's say, in, in the example that you gave. But there will be elements that keep things fresh or unsettled, I think. And that's part of the beauty, in a sense, of the diaspora experience, both from a faith perspective and also the wider challenge that's presented to um, this common vision that we all share one identity. I think that's one of the difficulties that I think people have generally, particularly people of faith, because they fear that diversity, they fear that slight shift, and that kind of triggers different reactions in people, usually defensive reactions. But the fact that we live in such a global world now that people have moved to such a degree and have traveled to such a degree will create a generation that will be more comfortable with elements of novelty or diversity within their own shared tradition. Let's take a step back. I wonder, Miriam, whether the pre-modern period that you specialize in can shed some light on the contemporary situation. I think it does, because it really shows how diaspora and ideas about diaspora tie in with dynamics of power. So I think we're talking about diaspora communities much more now because we're all grown up with the idea of nationalism. The nation as a sort of homogeneous pool, one language, one religion, makes people of other religions stand out, right? So diaspora communities who have different faiths are more obvious. And uh, when you go back, for example, to the time I work on, medieval Egypt, the diaspora is actually the ruling class is really the diaspora. It's the Fatimids who've come in from a different place and who have taken over power. And that's something that has a long tradition in Egypt. Cleopatra, the Ptolemaeans, this was Greek diaspora ruling over Egypt. So interestingly, in Egypt, we basically have diaspora communities being in power and uh, people don't even realize that it's the ruling class that is the diaspora. And Dragos in Romania, of course, there is this, what would you say, tension or creative tension between the nationality and the religion itself? Particularly in the Orthodox Church, there is that dimension, isn't there? Yes, there certainly is. Some people see it as a great strength because it welds together culture, ethnic identity, national identity with religious identity. But obviously this is a double-edged sword. It can have this ugly side in, in a sense which leads to nationalism, to a degree of rejection of anything foreign or alien or the propensity to label things as alien or as not appropriate for, for one's context very quickly. And it actually has led to the condemnation in theological terms of the heresy of ethnophilitism at a synod in Constantinople in the late 19th century, if I recall. There is this status quo, basically, which has been created over centuries. But now, in terms of the relationship between what you've just mentioned in your question and the fact that in a diaspora community or in a diaspora context, one immediately sees the tension, again, we, we come back to this word tension, between the need to negotiate what I like to call, I mean, inspired by David Martin, the um, British sociologist of religion, sort of a landlocked identity and a portable identity. We all come from a landlocked identity, in a sense, which is basically territory bound. And then when you move out of your country, identity is immediately challenged, in a sense, both by geography and by social dynamic. And then you have to make a transition to a sort of a portable identity, both in terms of your culture, nation, language, and so on, but also of your religious identity. And some people have an easier time making that transition, I think, and some communities have an easier time making that transition uh, than others. And this is, I think, to me, sort of the big crossroad, <laughs> to put it this way, in the, in the dynamic of diaspora, particularly faith communities in the diaspora, uh, whether this transition between a landlocked 
and a portable identity, very much applicable um, in a religious context as well, is happening. And and a portable identity, I think, needs to maintain a core of the territory bound identity that one has come out of, in a sense. The territory bound. I really like that idea that you just mentioned this. I remember I was so surprised when I learned that Indians, as soon as they crossed the ocean, would lose their caste system in the olden days. It was one of the problems of British uh, imperial strategies. But um, the fact that you would actually lose your status in the world as soon as you moved out of India. I mean, I find that idea absolutely fascinating. I think that's an excellent example. I've spoken with a lot of people in my parish, in the community here, and I think this is replicated everywhere. Romanian who say, well, I've come to England and I have to start from scratch. And that's people who were, you know, university educated, some had postgraduate degrees, for example, and they had to either take jobs in different areas of their qualifications or literally start from scratch because they had to literally buy new cutlery for the place that they moved in. So this sense of changing identities, of living with a portable identity, I think is in a sense the crux of the issue when we talk about these things. So there's a hybrid nature, isn't there, Dragos, to one's identity, the sort of question of hybrid identities, if you like. And before we take a break, I wanted to ask that question of you in particular, both as a Romanian and as an Orthodox Christian, because sometimes in the West, we don't really get this intimate relationship between the two. And I know the listeners would be interested. Would you see yourself more as a part of the Orthodox diaspora or part of the Romanian diaspora? That's an excellent question, Ed. I must confess, I have not really asked myself this question. So you're putting into words something that has been at the back of my mind, at the back of my psyche ever since I came to the UK, in a sense. But I never, on the one hand, felt the need to formulate it like this. But to try and answer it is yes and no. What are the things that I identify with in terms of the Orthodox diaspora? And what are the things I identify with in terms of the Romanian diaspora? I certainly identify with the cultural heritage, with the background of the generation that came out of Romania in the late 1990s and then mid 2000s. We share kind of the same roots in that sense. But I also identify very much with the Orthodox diaspora because there is a sense of brotherhood, of continuity, of shared faith, both in terms of the Romanian community, but throughout all the kind of traditionally orthodox nations. So I feel comfortable going to a Greek church, in a Russian church. Everything is familiar in a Ukrainian church is one all. So yes, I think it's a mixture of both things. You know, Dragos, that's a very Jewish response, if you don't mind me saying, to an orthodox Christian. It reminds me of the story of one of my teachers called Isidore Tversky. And a student in the class made a point and Tversky said to him, you are right. You are 100% right. Now I'm going to tell you where you went wrong. <laughs> this is Naked Reflections with me, Ed Kessler. My guests are Dragos Horescu and Esther Miriam Wagner. Our subject is the diaspora. The story of the physicist Lisa Meitner, told by Nicola Davis in an article on the Naked Scientist website, is an almost archetypal one, troubling of course, but in this case, ultimately positive. The growing political unease of Germany cast many obstacles in the way of academic research, yet Meitner, who was of Jewish ancestry, continued her work even after many of her rights had been suppressed. After the Anschluss in 1938, Meitner was forced to flee undercover to the Netherlands and from there to Sweden. In exile, Meitner pursued her research into radioactivity, corresponding with the distinguished Danish scientist Niels Bohr, and discussing her results with her nephew Otto Frisch. The story demonstrates that diasporas can be a powerful engine for creativity. Why is that, Miriam? I think creativity is often fueled by suffering. That's just a, a fact. I know that a lot of people who say you can be creative when you're happy, but um, I think deep down a lot of us know that we are much more creative when there is some sort of trauma or when there is any pain that you're feeling that then can translate into something. So I think in a way, diaspora communities, through the pain, through the suffering, have often been more creative or more sort of versatile. They had to be more versatile through sheer pragmatism. And I think that's sort of fueled this idea of a, of a creative diasporic community. The Jewish diaspora has ebbed and flowed since biblical times, really, hasn't it? With the Israelites in Egypt and, and of course, in Babylonia. But what does the story of the Jewish diaspora tell us about diasporas as a whole. The beautiful thing with the Jewish diaspora is that 
it's really, really part of the scripture already because they had this displacement experience even before some of the prophets revealed their prophecies. The Babylonian captivity is a central theme in a lot of Jewish liturgy. The interesting thing is when we talk about the establishment of the state of Israel now, is that we have some Jewish intellectual, for example, Abi Shlaim in Oxford, who's a, a controversial figure, he thinks that Judaism loses something by the establishment of the state because the diasporic suffering experience is going away. And it's, um, it's basically for him taking away this great creativity that the Jewish community always had to display in order to survive in hostile environments. Is there an echo there, Dragos, with the Romanian community? Because this connection between a people or a, a faith community in a land, which is very central to Judaism, as you know, and, and frankly, in Hinduism, the concept of Mother India. I personally feel that the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant churches don't quite have a sense of what land theology is, if you like. But I suspect the Orthodox churches do, because what we were saying earlier in terms of this attachment to Romania or to Serbia or to Greece you know, to, or to Russia, the sense of land and faith. Yes, I think there is. I think there's this underlying idea that that land where you received your faith, where your parents have received the faith, where they were welcomed into the faith, is a land connected with revelation. And there's a unique relationship between the revelation of God in that particular place, which is in a sense incarnate or embedded in the generations that are there, were there, and the practice that followed cultural, religious, social, and whatnot. So I think that connection between land and faith and faith identity has something at its root connected to divine revelation, because it's part of how it became known and, and experienced in that particular context. And again, this is part of the negotiation of that revelation is how do you make it relevant? How do you replant it or so you carry it with you if you move out of that context? And there's possibly a sense of longing, you know, certainly for the first generation of migrants, for the country of their birth and all the other things, um, to a degree that certainly was the case with the Russian migration after the 1917 revolution. Another element which is different, I think, from what happened in the 20th century, what's happening in the 21st century, is that we experience, certainly in Europe, much more circular migration. We have easier means of travel, of communicating, of going back. There is no longer that sense that migration or moving out is permanent. You mentioned modern times, and I think we should bring it right up to date. Is a diaspora today kind of anachronistic in the world of, of social media and the global village in which we live? It's changed completely, hasn't it? I think so. And again, it has to do with modern Western ideas of community versus the individual. When we travel back in time, the periods I work on, diaspora communities aren't really a problem because you have these complete segregation between communities that is desired by the state. People live in their communities. They don't rub up against each other much. If they are, then th there's usually sort of measures in place to avoid this. But of course, we try to do very different things in our modern states. We are trying to talk about individuals. We're trying to bring people together. And this is when the tensions happen. This is when actually communities rub against one another. This is when we actually try to create communities where people are connected, not just to their own community, but to, to all other communities where you actually constantly explore the other. So I think that's a very good question, Ed, about whether the word itself, diaspora, is an anachronistic word. And I would say yes and no. I think on the one hand, we still have to use the word diaspora because we have not yet made the word obsolete through our actions and policies. And on the other hand, diaspora, the word itself, everything that's connected with it, this diaspora status, I think, helps minorities, helps them to have a voice, to have a context in which they can operate, they can engage with state authorities, with other communities, um, and so on. So again, the fact that we still have to use diaspora, and it's something that we continue to talk about, it's on one hand a, a damning testament to the fact that we're still somewhere in the early 20th century, um, in this sense, and the fact that it does provide still a safe space, I suppose, and uh, can create a positive context for the displaced people in displaced communities to uh, make positive gains and to progress in, in integration and in, in, in identity. This question of identity makes me want to ask whether diaspora is, is still associated with a desire to return to that land with which you're connected. 
So I, I suspect, Miriam, you have no desire to return to eastern Germany or to the eastern part of Germany today. But is there something where there still is this desire to return? I think so. And I think, again, there's a binary there. There are communities where, for example, like with Judaism, there is, it's in the fabric, right? It, the return to Jerusalem at, at the end of days, at least, sort of when the Messiah comes, there is there's something that is there in scripture that sort of frames this return. And we have this in other communities as well. For example, the Zoroastrians, the Farsis, the Parsis in India, or the Druzes, where you have these extreme isolated communities who but some of them more, others less dream of a, of a return to a former state. But other communities, for example, the Irish and the Italians, you would have talked in the beginning of the 20th century, you would have talked about an Italian diaspora in, in the US, or you would have talked about a, an Irish diaspora. You don't do that anymore, because I think it's become part of the American fabric. I don't know about the Italian, but certainly having spent some time recently in Dublin, I'm very aware of the influence of the Irish diaspora including particularly actually in the States, on Ireland, both culturally as well as nationally, maybe not religiously. Do you think they want to return? Well, as you were speaking, I think there's a desire to visit, to invest, to give charitable donations. And religiously, of course, one might talk about the pilgrimage, whether it's to Mecca or whether it's to Jerusalem, the sense of, and holy sites in Romania as well, I suspect, Dragos, but not necessarily to go and live there. So there's a difference, isn't there, between visiting and feeling connected and investing, whether it's emotional or whether it's financial or whatever, and dreaming to actually go back. I think it was really beautifully portrayed in the film Brooklyn, where it was shown that the protagonist loved Ireland and she went back, but then she felt really constrained. And then her freedom and her future was in the US when she returns there. Yes, but it was a different time, wasn't it, Dragos? Because what you were saying was the, was the circular nature of migration. So the Brooklyn story was yeah. set 50 years ago. But today you could pop back very easily, right? In a way that even 20 years ago you couldn't. So what difference has that made, do you think, to the concept of diaspora? Well, every time I go back to Romania, to my hometown, for example, it only takes me about half an hour or an hour to get over the longing or the yearning, simply because it's such a reality check. And I'm not saying that disparagingly, but things change, things move on. And this yearning to go back to as things were is paradoxical. You want to freeze time in a sense and you want to go back there, but you carry with you your life experience that you've had abroad, for example, and people have moved on with their lives. Again, it's part of that tension. The paradox in a sense is that the more someone spends as a member of a diaspora community, the more they have this growing feeling of, of wanting to go back to a degree, but the more difficult it becomes. They, they grow roots in the other place, as it were, and that other place becomes their own place. And that's part of the tension. One amazing thing that, um, again, is always on my mind when this topic comes up is this idea. I mean, it was an idea that I first came across in the work of this Israeli sociologist, Shmuel Eisenstadt. But he talked about multiple modernities and he was deconstructing this idea that there's one modernity, the Western one, which is, and indeed it is dominant and in some places it can take over to a degree. But we live in this on the one hand, we live in multiple modernities, but my own um, assertion would be that at the dawn of the 21st century, we actually now live in simultaneous modernities. Experience the modernity of their home country together at the same time with the modernity of their country of adoption. And this is, for some people, traumatic because sometimes they live in two worlds at once. But at the same time, it creates difficulties for all the meta-narratives that we were raised up with in terms of our nation is the best we have the best food we have the best musicians we have the bravest soldiers and whatnot and you realize that's not the case and that's just a fact of life it's not a qualitative disparaging statement but again to me this is a very positive thing i think it leads to progress as painful as that might be at some point but i think possibly will lead to us truly becoming a global village in the real sense of the world, not because of economic ties or because of capitalism, but because of social and human exchange and faith cohabitation in a sense. What impact do you think there will be on the Orthodox diaspora, Dragos, by the number of Ukrainian refugees? 
Well, um, again, it depends. I think it depends on several, or at least three factors. One is it depends on integration, whether this Orthodox diaspora of Ukrainian heritage will be a closed one, basically in a looking type of migration movement, trying to process traumas from the country and the history, or it will be an open one, open to the West, open to other communities and so on. Um, and it will depend on the question of adding further fragmentation to the Orthodox presence in the West, whether that's because of jurisdictional issues or maybe lack of cooperation, you know, integration with the other Orthodox communities. And I think finally, it will depend on whether this Ukrainian diaspora will lead possibly to a revival of the Orthodox contribution in the West, because it will be inevitably rooted in the experience of suffering, persecution, which is very fresh now in that sense. So again, it, it's early days in a sense, but all of these things come into play. From what one sees in the news, certainly, is that a lot of the Ukrainians who have come to Western Europe, you know, from Poland all the way to the UK, have a very clear desire to go back as quickly as they can, in a sense. And I see this is a very positive thing, but if that won't be possible, I hope that they will become one of the driving forces of integration and a positive faith practice um, in, in the West as well. Yeah. That is a reality check, Dragos. I imagine the movement of people and the scattering of cultures will go on forever, but sad to say this podcast has come to an end. Thanks to my guests, Father Dragos Horescu and Dr. Esther Miriam Wagner, and thanks to you for your attention. If you enjoyed the show, you might want to browse our archive of podcasts, which includes that dialogue about the movement of peoples, war, peace, identity, plenty of insights for you there. And feel free to check out other podcasts from the Wolf Institute or from our friends at the Naked Scientists. I'll be back next week with more guests.